All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm bringing you greetings from the School of Education as well as the Center for Urban Education. My name is Chris Wright. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Urban Education Program. And I'm very excited to engage in this conversation with Kali Okuno, but I wanted to offer um, just some words for housekeeping first. So I know that the listing online says that it will be a conversation and dialogue with um, Dr. Sabina Vaught, myself, and Kali Okuno. Dr. Vaught is here, um, but she is currently in the background and she's gonna be helping facilitate um, the questions to me for the Q&A. And so what that means is that um, Doc, or excuse me, uh, Kali Okuno and I will be engaging in dialogue after he first um, gives his talk. And so the question and answers um, portion of the talk will be implemented into that dialogue. So um, those of you who are in the audience, please send in your questions freely. Um, there will not be a moment where you need to send them in, but rather you can send them in um, as soon as they come. And I'll do my best to implement them into the dialogue with myself and Kali. Um, and so now I will introduce Kali. So Kali Okuno is a founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. Okuno served as the director of the special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of the late Chokwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi. Okuno also served as the co-director of the U.S. Rights Network and was the executive director of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund that's based in New Orleans as a response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, he was a co-founder of the School of Social Justice and Community Development, which is a public school serving the academic needs of low-income African-American and Latino communities in Oakland, California. And so without further ado, Kali Okuno, you take the stage. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, especially in these uh, interesting times, tumultuous times. Um, only thing I would add to just uh, that introduction uh, is I use uh, he, him pronouns, anything said with love and respect. Um, and just, you know, want to uh, start off, you know, here we are, uh, was it Thursday, November 5th, 2020, two days after, you know, this uh, election, which many view to be uh, one of the most critical, uh, at least in the US, you know, uh, in modern history, uh, in terms of which direction uh, the United States was going uh, to go. Uh, today, I'm going to challenge some of that narrative and get try to get some of you uh, to think about it in a in a different way and to put it in a slightly different context and trying to do so uh, to situate your work uh, maybe in a slightly different way or, or maybe in an even uh, profoundly radical, radically different way uh, than where and how you've been doing it perhaps. You know, we can, we'll be in some dialogue maybe throughout the course of the day to, to kind of ascertain that. Um, but the first thing uh, I really just uh, kind of want to challenge and for us to put in, in mind is not just the U.S. dimensions or the so-called national dimensions of the, the kind of political and economic crisis uh, that this election is clearly responding to, uh, but to put it in a systemic context. Uh, we live in a global capitalist system that uh, over the past 500 plus years has become increasingly integrated, um, primarily through, you know, the, the advent of the European, Western European in particular, uh, global conquest of much of the world, or not all of it, but much of it, uh, and their subsequent domination of it pretty much the last uh, 500 years. Um, I bring this up because you cannot understand I would argue uh, all the dynamics that you are experiencing wherever you are in the United States without understanding how the global economy is working and then the, the political economy that is built on that in an international context. So uh, many people have been, uh, you know, I think rightfully concerned uh, about 
uh, what, what folks have been calling uh, the fascist or neo-fascist direction that Trump has been uh, uh, kind of moving the country into. And I think we need to, you know, take, let's try to step back again, looking at and trying to put things in the global context and perspective uh, and look at um, him not as an anomaly within the present global system, but actually uh, just a manifestation of the, the many deep crises and contradictions within it uh, and how the system itself overall uh, has been breaking down uh, uh, for quite some time. You know, really a, a one could argue uh, much of the last uh, 50 years, uh, particularly as the Bretton Woods institutions uh, have been breaking down and have to adjust uh, to the rise of Asia, to, to the rise of... Uh, to the recovery of uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, to the greater expansion of uh, the economy and rights uh, in, in much of uh, uh, Central and South America uh, over the period of this time, uh, the rapid kind of changes that have taken place over this period uh, on the African continent with decolonization, uh, now decades of, of neo-colonial uh, uh, rule uh, undermining uh, the national liberation movements and their aspiration uh, for liberation, social, political, and economic liberation. Uh, so there's been some profound changes that all of this is uh, responding to. Um, now, there's, that doesn't mean there's not particularities to the United States. Um, of course, there are the particularities everywhere, but these all fit into a global pattern is basically what I'm, I, I want us to look at and, and understand. And we have to put Trump, you know, firmly uh, uh, in place as, as part of a, a definite rightward trend uh, that's been going on, you know, really since the 80s, um, if not before, but definitely on a political level where these right-wing political figures um, who come from the hard kind of radical right, if you would, uh, have captured state offices and been able to orchestrate it in uh, substantive changes um, you know, in the overall uh, social and political character uh, of the nation states, the national states that, that, that they are presiding over. Uh, many can go back to uh, the kind of first major uh, transformation um, with Reagan and Thatcher um, in the UK and the US uh, respectively. But if we just kind of fast forward to the present, you know, you see a consistent pattern um, if you just want to go from, you know, east to west, you know, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, um, uh, I'm forgetting it, uh, um, his name in uh, Erdogan uh, uh, in Turkey, um, uh, was it Morsi in, in uh, Egypt, uh, Urban in, in uh, Hungary. Uh, Boris Yeltsin in, in uh, the UK, uh, Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, and then Trump. And these are just a few. There's a lot more that, that we could cite, but these are just some of the, the critical names of uh, these kind of national figures, presidents and prime ministers um, who have been pushing uh, and advocating for a, a series of hard right uh, policies uh, aimed at, in part, uh, uh, renationalizing their economies to a, to a certain extent to try to protect uh, the workers and the citizens within their respective nation states, uh, but doing so on clear uh, programs rooted in uh, racism, ethnocentrism, uh, xenophobia, uh, you know, homophobia, and misogyny across the board uh, with every single uh, individual that I mentioned. Uh, and this is systemic. Again, going back to that, you know, uh, part of what we're seeing is that have been seeing, you know, from for particularly much of the last twenty years, it's crisis after crisis, and uh, the the system, you know, making minor adjustments, making minor tweaks, but trying to stay along the same kind of neoliberal orientation and path. Um, to kind of resolve these contradictions and resolve these crises. And it's failing time and time again. So you see periodically from, you know, the, the Asian market crash in the late 1990s uh, to the, 
uh, housing boom bubble crash, you know, 2006 to 2009, um, and these, these kind of mismatch recoveries uh, that have taken place on a global scale and it's extreme cases of immiseration that have happened in the context, particularly the last 20 years in places like Greece, uh, places like Argentina, where the, the overall uh, standard of living has just totally collapsed for many, you know, from uh, kind of the, the uh, first or second world status that many believe that those countries were in, you know, in the 1960s and 1970s and part of the 1980s. Um, so we have to look at, you know, what's happening here uh, in that context, uh, first and foremost. Um, to get, I think, a, a clear understanding of what's at play here and how it's going to uh, roll out. Um, now, most of, you know, people thought the good, good deal, I think, you know, the, the liberal to radical, left radical kind of wing uh, really saw this uh, and were kind of positioning this particular election cycle as a referendum on Trump. And there was this expectation uh, that because he's been so blatantly racist, blatantly misogynist, blatantly, you know, uh, xenophobic, um, that that was going to just translate into a massive wave of uh, uh, rejection of Trump. And I was saying, you know, for many years that people were analyzing, in fact, some of the wrong things uh, and that uh, I would, would be shocked. In fact, I predicted that Trump was going to win re-election, not win the popular vote, but win the electoral college. And he still may, may he still might, uh, you know, from what we're seeing, you know, with, with some of the results and things that are tallying up, you know, if he wins Pennsylvania, probably Arizona is looking like, which he's very much uh, kind of in position still to do, he could still win. And I know that many people, uh, you know, uh, I think with with Coney kind of looking at things within a narrow kind of U.S. context, uh, we're, we're somewhat surprised and I think are, are taking this kind of view uh, the, of being shocked at how many people voted for, you know, uh, this racist, for the xenophobe. And I don't think in all of that, there's been a, a deep interrogation uh, of his actual uh, policies and message and who that's speaking to and how they perceive it. Um, Trump, I don't think played his best card, which was to really talk about uh, the economy. I think if he would have focused really on that, he would have had an even stronger uh, showing. Uh, so he kind of got in his own way, which he's, he's been doing, but you know, to a large extent, it, it really didn't hurt him as bad as many thought it would. Um, but the other side uh, primarily focused on uh, morality. And the problem with uh, that type of orientation is there's not many people who can eat uh, morality, who can be fed by morality, not in the world system, the capitalist world system that we live in. Um, and they, they have to uh, act based upon the interests uh, that they have. Now, some of that clearly is ideological. Some of it is definitely uh, positional relative to folks' understanding of, of, you know, where they fit in the social kind of hierarchy of, around race and gender in particular. Um, you know, but if you look at some of the, the pieces of what's going on in particular, like in uh, Nevada, where there's still some major questions, you know, uh, Trump's arguments around opening up the economy rather than kind of slowing it down as a response to the pandemic, that's actually looking like it, it uh, is going to have a major impact, maybe a decisive impact, uh, because folks uh, pretty much uh, in Nevada, uh, where the economy is dominated uh, by uh, Las Vegas and Reno, uh, is dependent upon uh, tourism uh, in the main uh, and that requires people traveling, people moving. Uh, and so you have a varied of aligned interest between you know, both the workers and the, and the owners and the managers uh, to support this narrative around reopening. Uh, and so we can't short sight these things. We have to look at them on a deeper level. And my point being the neoliberal orientation in particular uh, of Biden 
and the DNC and the forces who've been, been uh, dominating uh, the uh, Democratic Party now for decades um, leads fundamentally to dead ends. And it's going to continue to catch up with them, you know, time and time again, uh, both in terms of uh, kind of turnout and participation, um, but also uh, where and how folks see their interests being aligned. Um, you know, when uh, Trump and Bernie can appeal both in 2016 and 2020 uh, to same, some of the same core elements, even though in reality they're, they're uh, kind of economic prescriptions point in slightly different directions. And I say slightly and I'll come back to why. Um, you know, and, and you wouldn't feel that they find they should have some common ground uh, speaks to this kind of uh, orientation, which I'm going to argue with all of you and hope we take it up. Um, that, you know, what in effect is happening both in the United States uh, and other places, I think in the world right now uh, is delaying uh, a, a deeper crisis. Uh, it's an, it's critical efforts to kind of delay uh, a real, you know, fascistic social order uh, that capital really needs to kind of restore uh, the profit margins that it wants and the system really wants and needs to kind of balance things out to where, uh, you know, those who benefit most from this system uh, are satisfied with the returns, you know, both in terms of the, their capital yield, but also in terms of the social control. And I think we have been, by putting what, what everything in context, what we are moving and marching towards um, is, is more broad acceptance on a global scale of uh, surrendering certain kind of political rights, bourgeois rights, um, freedom of press, freedom of speech, et cetera, for more and more economic security as the system is, is increasingly unable to produce that uh, for masses of people, at least to the level of what people's aspirations are. And that's an important point. Uh, and it's an important point because it's not like the system uh, on, a, on a whole uh, is not able to produce the goods and services uh, that humanity needs uh, to live a higher quality of living. Uh, we do not have in the world system uh, a production problem. Uh, there's actually overcapacity, overproduction uh, on a global scale, not just on a national scale. Um, and to the point where there is no reason, there is no sound reason uh, in this day and age with the technology that is now uh, firmly in the possession of humanity um, that anybody you know, should be without adequate housing, adequate health care. Uh, education uh, and food, caloric intake, clean water, things of that nature. Uh, one aspect of this 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 problem is a is a problem of distribution because there's more than enough goods, there's, there's food and things like that wasted every single day, and there's more than enough uh, actual kind of economic resources, financial resources, uh, to kind of go around uh, to deal with these these questions if there was a form of prioritization. But even deeper still. We cannot leave the, the actual solutions uh, to one to, just towards distribution because uh, that puts us back in a dynamic wherein uh, if we bend the stick as what happened uh, in the middle of the 20th century uh, with the social democratic experiments which took place to a limited degree here in the United States with the welfare state system and to a more extensive degree in, in Western Europe and, and in Latin America, um, you know, was the social democratic uh, uh, kind of uh, institutions that were created up universal health care in many places, you know, profound uh, pension uh, uh, plans and retirement plans, things that you see in some of those countries that are being eroded away and taken away. Um, uh, these things can be somewhat granted, but we see that if they're not fully kind of situated in, in broad process of, of actual democratic control, uh, uh, particularly by, you know, uh, the workers that these things can be uh, what was given can be taken away. You know, let's just put it that way. Um, uh, because the ownership question fundamentally hasn't changed. And that is basically, you know, what we are uh, looking at. And uh, this notion that, you know, Biden and, and those who are supporting him are gonna, are gonna try to uh, resolve this deep crisis uh, through more kind of neoliberal 
uh, forms of austerity kind of put things on track is only going to, I would argue, um, deepen this crisis and, and give in the long term more strength for, for monsters even far worse than uh, Trump. Um, and, and this is a piece that I think we need to really look at. And it's, it's critical, I think, to try to put this in a, in a and I'm do, trying to do this, you know, some, some profound things in a short period of time, and maybe we can get more into, into depth doing the question and answers in other sessions. But, um, you know, we really have to go deep uh, in the days ahead and really interrogating first and foremost, uh, the radical imagination uh, to really be able to envision a different world, a different system, a different set of processes by which uh, society can be governed. Because clearly, uh, the one we have now is is riddled with uh, errors, and not by accident, but by intent. You know, the Electoral College uh, was built to be a profoundly anti-democratic institution, and was was set in place uh, to ensure. Uh, that those who were in, 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 in control of uh, one section of humanity as their property as chattel uh, could use that as leverage uh, against the, the more Northern states, which at that time and still uh, have greater population uh, densities. Uh, this was set up you know, by design in a system uh, which was never intended to bring all of those uh, who lived or were subject to it uh, fully into democratic processes. We have to remember, you know, that the initial kind of bourgeois rights that this country were founded on were very exclusively uh, in the possession of white men and not all white men, but a small group of uh, folks who own uh, uh, property and, and had a certain status. And that uh, that has been expanded through profound struggle uh, uh, by working class people, by oppressed people, uh, uh, and other social sectors, women, um, et cetera, we can go down the line that these things have been expanded. But in their expansion, uh, the fundamental rules of the games of what you can vote for, uh, what you can vote against have not changed. You know, So we have to look at that and interrogate that uh, more clearly and deeply, um, use our radical imagination to envision something you know, profoundly different uh, that really speaks toward the, towards the equality uh, um, and equity, you know, that I think all of us in some form or fashion want to get to uh, in the world system because this system will not produce that result. So we have to think different and then we have to organize different in order to get there. So I'll stop there, um, you know, for now uh, and, and uh, come to some, some uh, questions and debate, um, you know, to, to liven up a discussion. All right, all right, that sounds good. Thank you for that. Um, one of the uh, the first questions it came it came from the audience. But I think it'll help sort of set the stage for the dialogue. But um, um, could you speak to um, your political education? Sort of how you came to consciousness. How what what is it that you are or that you were reading? watching, listening to um, that is influencing your radical imagination. And if you have any like suggestions in terms of that, feel free to throw those out as well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm a movement baby. I'm a black power baby. Um, both of my parents, you know, were uh, in radical organizations, you know, before I was born um and and fundamentally remain uh politically active throughout most of their their lives um so i grew up you know going to meetings you know some of my earliest memories uh were going to some of the very first uh, african liberation day uh um you know marches and demonstrations in in the early 1970s you know and uh being part of uh, uh, meetings where, you know, uh, parents and other extended family members, you know, were um, trying to organize material aid, you know, for Angola uh, uh, and getting Basal in Mozambique, um, you know, in, in, the, in the early 1970s in the anti-apartheid movement was, was a deep uh, backdrop uh, in my household. Um, you know, there was always keeping up with 
you know, what was going on, um, uh, particularly after 76. And, and I remember that clearly because that's the year, you know, my, my younger brother was born. Uh, you know, what was going on uh, in uh, Azania, also known as South Africa, um, you know, year in, year out after the Soweto uprising and rebellion, you know, what or what Azapo was doing, which for those who don't know, you know, is the, the Azanian People's Organization or what uh, was the PAC doing, the Pan-Africanist Congress or what uh, uh, the ANC was doing, the, you know, the African National Congress. So, um, you know, I had the benefit of growing up uh, in that environment. And I cite that, those as, as examples, you know, to put in context the, the kind of the, the international orientation uh, that my parents had, which, which uh, you know, I'm, I find to be a blessing. I got to travel a lot when I was a, a kid, um, you know, uh, both through, you know, in, uh, in the United States and, and outside of it for a good number of years. So that really helped to, uh, I think, really ground me um, and in in a solid understanding that how things are done here is not the way things are done elsewhere, and that all that, that left me with you know a profound understanding that the, the way things are is not the way that they have to be, right? And I think unfortunately for a lot of folks who don't have the benefit of those types of experiences, you know, you kind of limited by what you know, and if your if your frame of reference and your exposure is limited, uh, it's often hard to think you know, uh, of something different, um, you know, because you, 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 you subject to, uh, uh, what you experience for the most part and what you've been exposed to. Um, so I cite that, you know, is, is really the foundations of, uh, you know, the, my broad political education. Um, but, you know, uh, I've said this many times before and, and I, I'll repeat it here. You know, the, the, even being exposed to that, at some point I had to make my own choice to follow that path. You know, I was the, the one kid in the family uh, who liked going to the meeting. So that, I, I, I probably had a kind of narcissistic thing already going on in that regard. But, you know, I, uh, my brothers, you know, the, the two I grew up closest with were around the same way. And all they're deeply political people, they haven't chosen to be, you know, to, political activists to the extent to say I have. Um, so you have to make a choice, even with all that, you still have to make a choice. And the thing that, you know, really, uh, I would say was a was a real turning stone for me uh, was 1984, uh, growing up in Los Angeles, uh, for, for the most part, I wasn't living there at the time, I would just come back in the summers, and my family was living in, in the state of Washington, at that time. Um, but we would come back home uh, and the, the Olympics was, was in uh, the summer, you know, early part of the summer, we came back. Um, and, and it wasn't the Olympics. Let me get that clear to everybody. It was what was happening in Los Angeles uh, in the context of hosting the, Olymp the Olympics which really radicalized me in a profoundly deep way. And let me tell you what it was. Um, it was coming back and just seeing and witnessing, experiencing first and foremost, uh, about 20 members of my own family who were just locked up without charge for a couple of weeks in the context of, of the Olympics. Reason being, uh, many of them in one form or another were involved in some form of underground economy, uh, you know, to make ends meet. You know, I'm gonna just state it clearly, you know, for what it was, people selling, you know, uh, weed and things of that nature coming from, you know, uh, poor and impoverished parts of uh, LA and Watts and folks just, you know, in and out at that time, you know, this is the early eighties. So it's not like, you know, the, the, in LA, you know, for, for a lot of the black folks, like my parents and grandparents, my grandparents in particular who moved there and they moved there because the auto industry, the shipping industry and the tire and manufacturing industries by the 1980s, most of those jobs is gone. They 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 had dried up. So it wasn't like uh, my generation, the generation after, uh, we're going to go down and, and find a good job at, at Firestone, paying twenty dollars an hour. That had long since since passed, and we watched that with our parents. So folks were you know surviving, hustling best best they could. But what was the real trigger for me was not only that my folks were locked up, but coming back and seeing that the streets were had been made, you know, they were just swept. And what it dawned on me was just some of the different things that that 
in particular, my father was always trying to stress to me about the nature of the state and the nature of the system. And that, you know, many of the evils, as he put it, and ills that we were confronting in the Black community were being calculated, orchestrated, and organized and permitted by the system. And that was one of the moments where, you know, it's like it, it moved from rhetoric to like, wait a minute, it's, you know, my old man was telling me the truth. They could stop the drug trade anytime they want to. They know who the players are. They, you know, like their knowledge is, and so the streets were dry. And I just remember that whole summer just, just being in awe and just being like, okay, um, there are organized forces in this society. It's like, you know, some in, just invisible hand. Like there's some clear forces who are allowing this type of carnage and killing. And remember this was LA in the 1980s. So the gang warfare was just off the charts. So like they are allowing this to happen, you know, uh, and enabling this to happen and driving it to happen. So that was, that was to me the, the Creole, you know, that point in time where I was at is you just coming to being in the teenager and having to make these kind of choices of how I was going to engage my environment, that was a critical switch shift to, for me where that upbringing really came back to the fore. And, and uh, you know, I was thankful that I had, you know, knowledge already of, of folks like Amna Carr Cabral and, you know, uh, Samora Michelle and, um, um, you know, Malcolm X, of course, and, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and, you know, these things that, you know, Angela Davis and all, you know, that that all was all already a part of my upbringing. So in, in those materials were in my house, you know, the books and writings where things were there. So, you know, around the age of 14, I just started picking these things up, you know, uh, all these books up and starting to read them and digest them myself and study, you know, and not just, you know, pick up uh, automatically what, what, my, what my parents' views were, but to start formulating my own based upon my own experience. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. That's interesting. Interesting. You. That's interesting. You. You. You come to consciousness in 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 that way. I have a a bit of a follow up question to one of the points that you made. You talked about um, how your grandparents moved to L.A. for jobs, and after a certain period, the jobs are no longer there. I want to touch. I want to relate this to a point that you made in your um, book. And so, if, if folks watching have the book. Um, this is on it's at the beginning, towards the bottom of page nine. But you mentioned how the capitalist the capitalist system can no longer absorb those who have been dislocated and displaced. Mm -hmm. And you say it preserves itself by excluding or disposing of all surpluses that cannot be assumed by profit. Um, mm -hmm. And so, when you talked about the experience of your grandparents, that sort of the, that moment within the book sort of flash before me because I see them as connected and as relevant. Mm -hmm. I was wanting to know if you could speak to um, some of the ways that that exclusion and disposal is materialized in, in Black life in Jackson and, and, and beyond. Like, Well, let me put it this way. Um, all of us here, I think, are, are, you know, in some form or fashion, very well acquainted with, with the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that that didn't exist. Just imagine, so let's use our radical imagination. Let's imagine that didn't exist, right? That there wasn't, you know, between four and five million people, half of them black, that were locked up. Where would they be employed? Think about that. Where would they be employed in this system right now? Yeah, 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 I don't right? <laughs> I want everybody to think about where would they really be employed? Where would they find gainful employment? You know, uh, uh, to the measure to say, like, again, using the grandparents as, as a measure, you know, my grandfather or you know, my father said he couldn't read and write, right? He, 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 he was a construction worker and uh, mechanic. Uh, the man could build, you know, a house, a car, you know, without a <laughs> blueprint, you know, just had a tremendous amount of skill, but couldn't read and write. Uh, but, you know, when he came uh, uh, to California, you know, with the skill he had, he could get a job uh, uh, that paid well enough to, for him to, to you know, buy a house, with, with a modest house, two-bedroom house with eight, eight kids, but two-bedroom house, um, you know, and, and for the most part, you know, my grandmother worked, and on the side of the family, she worked when she wanted to work, you know, because he worked in a good factory and he had this, his construction business on, on, on the side. 
uh, by the time I, I came around, that wasn't available. You know, uh, uh, there wasn't no, nothing. I couldn't go down to, you know, like, like folk, folks used to do in, in Detroit. It used to be a period, they were talking about in the uh, 40s, 50s, and parts of the 60s in Detroit. You know, you can get fired from Chrysler, walk down the street and, and, and get a job at Ford the, the same day, right? Uh, uh, for folks, you know, that, that kind of, you know, uh, uh, old manufacturing, you know, area of the Midwest, but particularly up there in like Dearborn, all them kind of places. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, LA had a had a, a, a period like that. Oakland had a period like that. Pittsburgh, you know, where y'all had, 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 had a period like that. You know, slightly different industry, but you know, there, there was that period, like in the coal industry and steel and all that other kind of stuff that was there. Um, you know, that bottomed out. Um, uh, but we have to understand in part how it got built, right? Uh, and a large part of what happened after World War, well, really starting during the Great Depression, but you know, basically from 41 uh, to the mid 70s. The United States was in a very privileged position as a result of what happened in, you know, because of World War II, the industrial capacity of Japan, of, uh, you know, France, uh, most of Western Europe, but particularly Germany had been eviscerated. And you had a period um, where the United States, I think well up into the, the 1960s, uh, half, more than half of all the world's industrial production, like the production of steels, cars, you know, appliances, hard appliance, half of all of what was produced in, in the world was coming from the United States. So there was just a plentiful, uh, you know, degree of jobs. But the United States was very clear, you know, the, the ruling class force was very clear. They had to get the, the, the world economy going again, which is why they invested so much in the Marshall Plan and why they invested so much in the redevelopment of Japan and parts of East Asia. Part of that was, you know, containment of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the communist, you know, uh, uh, move at, at the time, you know, with China and North Korea, what became North Korea and Russia. Um, but, you know, that period dried up as Japan got back on its feet, as Germany got back on its feet um, in their industrial output and then the competition for markets and market access and the jobs that come with that. Uh, you know, as that kind of pick up. And then you had another piece to it, uh, which is uh, uh, more internal driven, uh, was, you know, uh, black folks and other folks pressing the system in the 50s and 60s to break, you know, the apartheid system that existed at that time, not like it's fully gone away in any form or fashion, but, you know, the, the obvious apartheid system as we basically kind of broke that down uh, we did so at a period when, you know, Black folks in particular formed the common core, you know, of uh, the industrial backbone of Chicago, Oakland, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, you know, Baltimore. Uh, and we were making uh, demands and acting on those demands, both in an organized fashion uh, and at times, you know, uh, bringing the system and production to, to its needs. And so that Force capital to make some some clear choices to off first start offshore and production down to the south. So moving you know some of the auto factories down to like Georgia to Atlanta, uh, um, but then increasingly more uh, overseas. You know where uh, they could extract more from workers, both in terms of wages and and working conditions. You know where there were no quote unquote rights uh, or unions or, or or union capacity to defend folks. Uh, you know, move them in, in, in that direction. So, you know, what this system has basically been doing since the 70s is, is trying to contain an escalating social problem of, of not being able uh, uh, to produce or to yield to uh, the demands to give people more uh, access. And what you see now, you know, was, was say like Trump's rhetoric. You know, this promise of bringing industrial jobs back, that resonates with a lot of folks, y'all. Black folks, you know, uh, Latinos, poor working class folks, that resonates with a lot of folks because they envision, you know, the, the great jobs of the 50s and 60s coming back, you know, being in auto, be it in coal, be it in steel, being in uh, manufacturing or being more in increasingly, you know, I know 
you know, Pittsburgh is, is kind of becoming or has been becoming like a tech hub, you know, for some time. One of these kind of tech nodes is Boston, the Silicon Valley. Pittsburgh has been trying to move in that direction for a while and having some some success at it. Um, you know, promising to bring this all back uh, uh, is very enticing and has, and has gotten a lot of folks to to flip and we'll continue to get a lot of, a lot of folks to flip. Now it's a pipe dream because to the extent that manufacturing comes back, at least on the terms that exist now, it's going to come back in an automated form because those companies are not going to pay $30 wages for, you know, uh, American workers, not too many of them. And you see, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a Nissan plant uh, in Mississippi, right? Uh, right outside of Jackson and Canton. Um, you know, and it's like a little city unto itself. And, you know, there's about 10,000 workers there. But, you know, for the amount of cars that they produce, uh, 10,000 is a paltry number. And they're not, they talking about now reducing it now um, down to 5,000. They've been making cuts. Uh, and they, they the latest, latest plan that we saw that they put out, they're talking about reducing the workforce down to 5,000 people, but increasing the amount of production 20%. So that automatically tells you they're going more in the automated direction, you know. So to the extent that they talk about bringing, you know, Apple and some of these folks to have them start doing uh, uh, production and stuff back, okay, it might come back, but it ain't gonna come back in a way that's going to employ millions of people. So the only way, um, you know, those types of manufacturing jobs would ever kind of come back to the United States is if they could eviscerate the rights of people in the United States. So that you would be you will be forced to accept, you know, working conditions reminiscent of the 19th century and wages reminiscent of the 19th century. That's the only way that that uh, a capital is going to surrender to bringing any of that back is if the concessions are totally given uh, to them in that fashion. Which is why people have been wondering, you know, why is there this this total disjuncture between Wall Street and Main Street? Why is Wall Street bubbling? It's bubbling and 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 bursting because uh, is is one number one fundamentally almost purely now based on speculation, uh, but it's all in anticipation of uh, whoever wins that that uh, austerity is going to be the name of the game, you know. And you saw like today one of the things uh, uh, um, I sent out to you know folks in in, in my networks and put on Facebook. Uh, woke up, we woke up this this morning. Uh, and uh, the beginning of trading, the U.S. Uh, stock market is uh, booming today, you know, uh, uh, in anticipation of the results. And they don't care who win. You know, the, the, they don't, they hedge their bets. They gave money to both sides, you know, uh, as they always do. And they, they just know that the terms that are going to be negotiated now are going to be terms that favor capital, not terms that favor, you know, working people. Because, you know, uh, either... Trump is going to get in, you know, with with kind of the same uh, setup, at least in the Senate that he had, um, or Biden is going to get in, but he's also going to have to, you know, deal with probably probably more than likely a Republican uh, uh, Senate, and that means, you know, for all y'all who are hoping that you were going, you know, push Biden left, it, it ain't going to happen because he's going to have to negotiate in real time with Mitch McConnell. And he's gonna have to get a cabinet pass that Mitch McConnell will accept, you know. So the the person in the real sense of politics in the here and now, the most powerful player on the chessboard right now is Mitch McConnell, regardless of what the outcome is. Everything is gonna have to come through him and his particular orientation and his particular brand, which mirrors Trump. But but is it, um, you know, they they have some pretty significant differences as well, at least at least tactically. Um, and I'm putting it out that that Mitch is to be feared even more for every those who wander and have been concerned because he actually knows how to govern, right? And 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 so he's going to be cutthroat, uh, especially now that, that he's holding more of the cards. So if you're thinking that Biden's going to get in, things are going to be any easier. You think again. That's not what's going to happen. Okay, interesting. Um. So within that, within that same vein, we had a question come in from somebody in the audience. Um, and they wanted to know, do you see the possibility of having a sustainable third party? 
perhaps one that comes from the various movements that are happening in the grassroots and on the ground. Um, and if not, um, how do we get people to sort of conceive of that being an actual possibility and a power that could come with the, with the third party that's a little more radical? This, a, this, this is a fundamental question. <laughs> Um, one I've spent a lot of time in, in my adult life trying to work on, you know, uh, in the form of you know, supporting a labor party, uh, a reconstruction party, which is a much more limited experiment, experiment uh, to New Orleans, Freedom Party in, in uh, Alabama, you know, with, with comrades there, um, you know, Green Party supporter, uh, and then trying to build something uh, independent in Jackson. Um, look, it's hard. It's hard. Um, and the hardest part about it, I'm gonna come back to let's make this a theme. The hardest part about it is our imaginations, our radical imaginations are too limited. Are too limited. I'm just gonna put that out. Uh, you know, and part of it, I, I, some of it you can understand why. You know, look, the Democratic Party uh, uh, is a beast. Don't think it's not. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like U.S. parties are similar to the European counterparts in the sense that you know you have a real uh, uh, disciplined kind of party apparatus that you might find in places like you know Western Europe. But their systems are also different. You know, there the parties actually have much more control about, you know, who they are, who they appoint and who their candidates are. In the United States, to a larger street, you know, the the, the monikers are, are are just forms of association until you get to kind of the higher levels. But it's not like there's some kind of um, pledge, you know, that, that I pledge to follow this program. That doesn't really exist per se in the United States. Uh, so candidates can run on any kind of uh, platform on any kind of banner. Where it becomes real. Uh, in the United States is different than, than say it is in Europe. Uh, here, your politics are measured by your your ability to fundraise, to be able to engage in the game, you know, to be able to run a successful campaign. That's where you you find out who really kind of runs the show here, and where the rubber meets the road. Um, and in the United States, you know, you either have to have uh, a consolidated base, uh, you know, with numbers that you can bring to bear uh, to the polls, or you got to have money. Um, and and for folks on you know who kind of lean to the left or progressive, you best to have both if you really want to uh, uh, you know get some semblance of somewhere. But you better have people for for damn sure. Um, cause that's the only way in certain places that you're going to be able to counter the, the impact of, of, uh, money, right? Uh, all in, but money is all the airtime, the, the pollster, the strategists, uh, the messages, accessing the voter rolls, the counts, the databases, you got to have all these different things. And then some to really run an effective campaign in, in the United States. Uh, so you can't avoid money, uh, here, but Money is not so much, also, you know, it's part of the problem, but what I'm going back to the radical, radical imagination, um, the way politics has been framed here for, for a long time uh, and where, you know, the, the radical movements of the 70s uh, really, in, in some respects, uh, bottomed out was the inability to build our own lasting political uh, institutions. And, you know, folks, I want you to go, you know, if you haven't heard of the National Black Independent Political Party before, write it down, look it up uh, and look up that history um, as one of many parties, La, La Raza Unida, another, you know, where, where you know, black folks, uh, 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 Chicanos, uh, you know, tried to form their own parties and then, uh, efforts to build kind of radical pieces, where they failed and why they failed. And a large part of uh, the piece that we have to deal with is this notion that we do not have the ability 
uh, to organize our own communities without the patronage uh, of, you know, uh, capital institution and capital forces. And until we really break from that, uh, we're not going to build a third force, right? Um, and and the the shortage of the imagination lies deep within the left. It, it's not like that's something that's in, in being imposed upon us. I would argue uh, that is deep debates that we have amongst ourselves. And the the fundamental organizing question always gets put, put off or postponed uh, uh, under the threat that, uh, well, we have to wait for another cycle, you know, because Bush is the most dangerous thing we've ever seen, right? Or Bush, you know, uh, uh, the Bush the second was the most dangerous thing we've ever seen, or Bush the first was the most dangerous thing we've ever seen, or Reagan is the most dangerous thing we've ever seen. So, you know, rather than kind of building on our own basis, we got to you know, join into this broad kind of popular front and do everything we can to to defeat the monster, you know, kind of uh, at the door. And that mentality uh, always puts off working people and oppressed people being able to organize, at least in the electoral arena, uh, in their own interest, in their own name, because you're trying to, you know, uh, it's, since the United States politics are zero sum, right? It's not like, you know, you could run and, and uh, you know, make some gains and have a seat in parliament that, that you can then, or in the Congress in our case, that you can then, you know, make an argument or make a pitch from or have a base from. It's like you either win or you lose. There ain't no other influence in, in, in between, you know, so uh, it, it's hard, but at some point we're gonna have to make this break. And that means uh, we're gonna have to come to clear grips uh, with, you know, uh, uh, progressive forces, radical forces, organizing their own interests and making a, a clear break uh, with liberal forces and, and uh, you know, the, their orientation around the preservation of empire and the preservation of capitalism. Um, you know, the, the, we got a lot of work to do to get to that point. And, and I don't think we are fully resolved in that because it's gonna tell some, some deep discussions about, um, how to organize uh, and how to deal with the impact uh, in the course of, you know, say an election cycle or two or maybe even three of after that split is gone, dealing with uh, the hard right uh, being at the helm and being in control. Cause that was, that's the reality of what would happen. Uh, but I'm one who argues, in fact, I think sadly that needs to happen because the, the, the kind of triage politics that have been on display, you know, uh, uh, basically since 68, you can go back further if you want to, but let's just start with 68, trying to keep Nixon from getting in office. There's been a right drift consistently every single uh, election cycle, um, you know, so much so that, that Obama uh, in many fundamental ways was to the right of Ronald Reagan. But his politics were viewed as progressive politics by the time, you know, uh, he came along. Uh, but if you put him in line in line with what Reagan was articulated, you would, you would probably people would have laughed him off the stage. But that's how far right this society has moved as a result of this kind of triage politics. So at some point in time, we're gonna have to stop. Okay, I have a uh, I have a bit of a two party question now. Um, one of them is a reference uh, to the book. You mentioned the old black national ad adage, politics without economics is symbol without substance. And so I wanted to, I wanted you to speak a little bit um, to the importance of economics in self-determination, but I wanted to um, add a second part to that question and put it in the context of the university. Um, so I'm wondering, and this is from my perspective as a as a student, how do you engage um, within this process when you're not an active participant of the university economy? So I pay tuition, I labor for the university, um, but I don't have any actual agency attached to what I pay or the labor I provide or how much I provide. In what ways do I go about engaging in, econo in an economic struggle for self-determination? What does that 
what do you think that looks like in general and on the and in the uh in the case of the university uh good questions um start with the last one or the, the second part uh first if if First and foremost, your section, which is like the graduate section, if y'all not organized, right, and, and have a common platform, common basis from which, you know, you are going to, to struggle on and struggle for, um, you're going to have little impact, right? Um, so the first thing has to happen is getting, you know, your, 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 your fellow colleagues organized and on page, you know, to the greatest extent possible, united on uh, what you're willing to do and and uh, and how far you're willing to go and to push certain things. Um, then, of course, you know, because you're all a few in number, um, you got to find out what the strategic intervention points are, right? You know, can withholding your labor, what, what could that actually do to the university? What, what is it strong? Is it enough, you know, to make them come to heal, to, to yield to some demands or make some changes? Uh, and if not, who else do you need aligned with you? So you got to look for for other allies, of folks who are involved. You know, uh, um, in this case, you know, at, at, at the what I would call, you know, the, the kind of points of production and, and the, the points of a uh, uh, kind of iteration. Um, you know, so do you have uh, what level of unity do you have with with uh, uh, the professors? You know, so there's the graduate students. What level of unity do you have with the professors? What level of unity do you have to, with the administrative staff? What level of uni unity do you have uh, with a with a sector which you know uh, people often overlook? You know, uh, with all the different support staff that exist there. You know, from the janitors to the cooks, to, it, like you know, um, you know. So from my vantage point, I would argue and articulate. You know, you got to look at look at organizing. Uh, you can look at it either from the organizing of trying to get the best deal that you can get you know, which is kind of the standard in this country union kind of orientation, or you can go further. You know, how do you, and I say the further is, how do you democratize a damn place, right? That's the deeper question, right? Uh, and that would entail all of those folks getting organized and then uh, the student body and the community the situation situated in also being organized and have a vision of what this institution would do. Like, how does it actually not just serve, you know, the, the limited number of folks who can who come there because they can afford either through grants, loans, or their parents are rich can afford to go there. But what can it really do uh, to make a broader impact, you know, within the, the the community, you know, to folks who can't pay, you know, bills? Like, you know, are, are there a way to open up the classrooms and make make them uh, uh, open, or you know, go back to open enrollment the way some of the gains that that our movements made, you know, uh, in the 1960s, where you know, uh, uh, in many cases, people get accredited. Uh, without paying a penny, you know, uh, but that was one through uh, a fierce struggle uh, and, and a high level of unity that had been uh, uh, won uh, by both the student movement uh, combined with, you know, uh, organizing the professors in the community around them. So there's some key lessons from that, 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 that period uh, that I think we have to kind of harken back to and look at some of the things that they, they, they moved. But I think you know it's, it's kind of finding out the leverage points based upon the the level of unity that you can amass to organizing is the first piece. Then you can start talking about you know your own leverage, and then the other critical piece there is you know you know there, there's there's questions of sacrifice that people are gonna have to look at because you're gonna have to amass some of your own uh, 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 resources in the end to be able to 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 pull this off. You know, so so what type of just starting say with the graduate students, what type of dues are y'all willing to, you know, put in like financial dues? You know, is it how much is that? And because you're trying to figure out at the end of the day, looking at you know a, a certain type of things, you know, can we afford? You know, if it came to it, could we afford a strike fund or something of, of that nature? You know, um, so I, I'm just putting it out. I, I'm not going to put it out in a way that you know that kind of. <laughs> Might threaten y'all, but but you know, uh, uh, since it's, this is on the university time, but this is uh, uh, things that y'all need to consider in, in the real, in the concrete. Um, now, in the broader sense, you know, it, it's it's the same dynamic. You know, um, um, I, I want everybody to to get a grip of this moment. 
you know, uh, it's, it's not the only book to read, but I think to help us understand a, lot, a large part of this, going back to some of the fundamentals of politics and so-called Western civilization, we, people need to go back and read uh, Machiavelli's The Prince. You know, and, and one of the key lessons there is, you know, you're gonna get what you are, what you are organized and strong enough to, to attain. Uh, nothing more, nothing less, right? The, the, the organization at the end of the day is gonna make the final determination, you know, because uh, um, you can have good strategy, you can have bad strategy, you know, but if you organize, you can, you can recover from bad strategy, right? But if you're not organized, really don't make a difference how good your strategy uh, uh, is if you don't have the, the, the capacity and the forces to execute it. Um, so, you know, um, for us, oftentimes, and where that statement is, is kind of situated is that, you know, going back to that piece, the, the earlier question about the, the parties, you know, like in, in building an alternate force. Uh, if we don't build up our own material uh, uh, base, we're always going to be beholden to somebody else, you know, and what their agendas are, uh, you know, and, and what they want to see move or what you're trying to convince them to see move. But if they give you resources, they can pull those resources. And so if you want in any sense dependent upon that, um, you actually not, you know, in, in, at the end of the day, kind of calling the shots. So, you know, th that's why we we have been stressing, trying to go back to the old national address that you do. You know, like uh, even if we only got 15 cents b between us, um, but we organized, you know, we can turn that 15 cents, you know, basically in, in, symbolically into a dollar if we have a, a you know, a, a clear and, and concise strategy and, and agreement around how we want to use it. Um, you know, that's the critical piece, you know, because for us, we, we are very clear. Um, you know, the, the economic base that we are starting from is not elaborate, it's not resource deep. So it's really dependent upon uh, our political unity to be able to execute it. And that, and that is where, and I don't mean unity in the sense of like, we're going to vote for this. Like, no, what are we actually going to do? What is actually work going to consist of? What is the prioritization, you know, what we need to, to kind of lay down, right? And, and, and that will enable us uh, to, to act independently, you know, and, and to be able to move how we want to move and not tell us, well, y'all can't do that uh, because if, if you do that, then we're going to kick you out of your house or, you know, we're going to fire you from your job. But I'm like, All right, I, I made my own job, you know, with this co-op. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm growing my own, own food or maybe on this little plot of land or I'm trade. With, so your threats are idle. You know, they don't mean the same thing. I don't have to, you know, put my head down and, and grin and bear it. Uh, in the same way, so it 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 calls for reorganization and the reprioritization of a, a, of a, the resources. Now, you know, and I and I say this in the sense of, you know, um, think of how much money was spent this election cycle just on advertisement. You know, by all the parties, just just how much of think of that. What that money could have done. Uh, uh, in terms of building new infrastructure in this country, you know, to build like 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 new jobs. So they're gonna spend all this money for this contest, but then turn around, come come January and February, and check we don't we don't have no money uh, uh, to build new schools. We don't got no money, you know, uh, to overhaul this or to to, to green the economy. Y'all just spent a couple of you know trillion dollars on the election. So clearly, there's resources. What's the priority? Of, of how those resources are being spent. Is it being spent to improve the overall lot of, of the people in the country? Or is it being spent to, to determine, you know, who's gonna control uh, the, the limited assets within the framework that exists? Like that's where the money is spent. And we have to figure out a way to get out of that, 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 that cycle. So the, the thing that we've been trying to stress with all the resources that, that we have you know, we made a premium uh, on our end to in Jackson to bring this more home with cooperation Jackson. We made a premium uh, on uh, trying to acquire as much land uh, and, and uh, you know, infrastructure, buildings and things of that nature uh, as possible with the resources that we have, um, you know, so that 
that we we have these assets that we could then, you know, utilize in the long term to generate our own economic activity. And you know, in, in the uh, co-ops are like most small businesses. Some of them work, some of them fail. They have their ups and downs. They have their transitions. They have their turnover. Uh, you know, some people want to go on to a new thing or find out. You know, this particular level of work or type of work is not for them. But because you know our, our institution owns the assets, and and uh, we own these things outright, you know, if something kind of fails or adjusts because we own the land, we can we can do something else on it. Because we own the building, we can open up another business, you know, on it, or you know, we can we can take time to kind of develop things uh, in a way that if we were purely dependent upon having to rent at market prices, we'd be starved out very quickly and run out run out the show. So, you know, this is the concrete way that we've been trying to manifest this whole piece around, you know, uh, uh, putting uh, uh, the material assets of what we need to survive, making that the prioritization of our, of, of our uh, kind of platform and, and priority of, of, work, of work and where we, you know, place our decisions. And, and that means in the concrete, what I was talking about, sacrifice, you know, what you are saying with the graduate students. So for us, that's meant that we don't pay ourselves much. Right, you know, because we place place the premium, we want to do this for the long term, right? And and to do this in such a way that we don't buy it so that we just own it. Our larger objective is to buy it to decommodify it, take it out of the speculative market, right? And say so we ain't gonna ever sell this a holder. We trying to accumulate more to take it out of these, but then it leaves a vested piece for the community and, and generations behind us to come and have these things as assets once we long off the scene or. You know, uh, passing the torch on to, to other folks, which is a critical thing that, you know, we're trying to do in the here and now, right, you know, with, within our organization. So, um, you know, that's, that is the, the, some of the fundamental ways I would say that, that we have to look at uh, these key pieces, but you, you got to have political unity and you got to have a strategy to make that adage uh, even work. Uh, and because we don't, we don't use that in the way that some people use it, which is, you know, to reinforce kind of a capitalist mindset. That's not how we've been trying to use it, you know, but to speak to the, the, the very real and material assets that we need uh, if we're gonna move ourselves forward and have some place to, to uh, uh, lay our heads in the future and not be run off, you know, run off the scene. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, uh, you, raised, you raised a lot of points that, um, that I wanna follow up uh, questions with. I'm gonna relate. Mm -hmm going back to your um to your text so in your text you were talking about the role of the state and you were talking about the role of state cooperatives um which is people who are sort of working for the state but working with the community and you talk about how um how there needs to be very intentional efforts to make sure that those who are um cooperatives are not co-opted um by the state are not co-opted by sort of the aims of the bourgeois class um, and so I want to, I want to relate, I want to just sort of ask a general question about that. Um, how do you see resistance efforts to that co-optation? What does that look like to not be co-opted? But I also want to link that back to the university because I think to the point that you were making about like, who are the professors and who are the administrators? I think that mm -hmm. there are like administrators and folks who are higher up within the university who want to work with graduate students and, and reimagine what the experience could look like. Um, but I think the co-optation comes very, very easily within the institution because um, education is so commodified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, um, what do you see universities um, as connected to the preservation of empire? How do those within the university who have a higher up sort of position resist being co-opted? And the last one is sort of, how do we um, decommodify knowledge and education to where the university isn't sort of seen as a capitalist reproduction or where it is a capitalist reproduction space? What does radical imagination fit into it being something different for the folks who are in it, but not of it in a sense? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, we have what, 20 minutes? For this section anyway, is that mm -hmm. is that right? Am I reading yeah. that right? Yeah, we're working with about uh, 20, I say 15, because we got to <laughs> exit from Dr. Okay. Dest. 
Uh, I'm, I'm saying because some of these questions take take time to, to kind of go through. Yeah. Um, you know, um, what's the purpose of education in society at this point? I mean, that, that's a question I think we really need to to, to look, look at. Yeah. And I'm asking that, you know, in 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 a former life. <laughs> seems like that um you know uh uh i was a teacher you know was involved in high school teaching and administration um and one of the worst nightmares i ever had um in the in the process of building a school of social justice you know the community development uh, which i know you, you read a little bit about um in the bio man that that piece uh some of the best work I think I've ever done, uh, but it gave me nightmares for for a while in the process of doing it, mm -hmm. and uh, was a real game changer for me. And you know, you, the question around uh, asking about my development, you know, the things that that shape you and and, and change you. Um, and this is what it was, you know, uh, uh, in the process of building this school and organizing for it. You know, it's like right, literally like a couple of days before it was actually set to open. And, and so folks know this, Oakland for a while, Oakland, California, Unified School District, uh, had for a brief period of time, uh, this kind of policy called the New, New Small Autonomous Schools Policy, which, um, you know, kind of gave, um, allowed for small experiments of up to 200 students in a school uh, to do, you know, kind of smaller concentrated education with this theory that smaller would, would enable smaller classes and smaller schools would enable more attention uh, to, to students in that, particularly in our area with, with you know, uh, impoverish, you know, uh, black and Latino folks that this would be more advantageous in the long run, something that I helped to work on, right, uh, the policy itself to get it passed. Um, so we had this school, you know, our own school where we could, we, we we created our own curriculum. We set our own hours. We set our own schedule. Um, it was kind of like like a, a charter school, but very much still, you know, within the Oakland Unified School District. So the teachers kept all the union, you know, rights, status, seniority, everything. So you know, it was kind of like the best of both worlds. But the piece that really just threw me out one day was, what am I preparing these, these students really to do? You know what am I really preparing them for? You know, because in, in in a recruiting, and I I believed it. What I don't think I you know was of selling wolf tickets. You know, I really believed that. You know, uh, uh, me and the team that I was working with, uh, we can prepare your children. You know, for get get ready to go to college. You know that, and that's what we went around and because we had, we had to recruit our students, so we knew the students, but we had to like convince the parents. So I knocking on hundreds of doors of parents. You know, and trying to like, hey, this is this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I believe I can do. Working with your child, you know, and the, the main thing was that we can get them college ready. We can get them there. Now, I fundamentally believe that, but then I just just had a nightmare. I was like, oh, okay, let's go. Let's say they go to college. Ain't no jobs for them. you know. Ain't nothing steady, readily available for them. So like, what am I preparing them for? And I didn't have an answer to that. You know what I'm saying? And it just it just messed me up. So it was like two years of doing hard work, but in the back of my mind, this was just burning. Like, you know, in the reality of the economy that we are, what are we preparing them for? And so that just raised me to, a, you know, one of these deeper questions where I was asking about time. What is the purpose of education in this society now? Right, you know, we know, given the history of how, you know, public edu education was constructed in the United States, you know, was basically trying to prepare, you know, uh, 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 the workforce uh, uh, to to be able to do uh, basic kind of uh, industrial jobs, you know, it was part of that, that 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 shift towards an industrial economy because in the old school, you know, kind of agricultural, you know, kind of societies that that uh, we all came from at one point in time. Well, not you know, most of us came from uh, uh, our backgrounds and history came from, you know, the the education was done primarily within the family and within your kind of your tight knit social network, you know, uh, um, and it was it was a more communal piece and it served for for folks to be able to to play particular roles within their society, right? It, given that most of our society's pre-capitalism, you know, you you didn't produce for value, you produced for for need, 
right, to, and to fulfill a certain role. So the education within that context was, was for you to fit in and play those particular roles. That switch to like, you know, you have to be able to do math. You have to be able to read and write and follow instructions. You have to learn how to be on time, you know, so you don't get fired. You know, the other different things, you have to learn how to sit up straight and obey orders and, you know, the, 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 you know, to follow the commands of management. Like that fundamentally was the purpose of, of education, you know, leading up to a place where, you know, the, the society, I would say up to, you know, uh, at least a society like this one, you know, up until roughly, I would say like the 1930s, um, had to deal with scarcity. Uh, scarcity fundamentally uh, has been conquered. I'm not saying it's gonna stay that way forever because we kind of exceed ecological limits and truth already. But, you know, for the moment, you know, real scarcity around at least caloric intake and stuff like that, energy, that's, something, that's really been conquered. It's not distributed equally, you know, uh, but that's been conquered. So, and most of that is, is, is due to profound economic uh, infrastructure that have been built, you know, over the course of the last 100 years. So, um, what's the purpose of, this, of, of the, the education of rote now? that we really got to seriously to, to uh, uh, question that, you know, I think in some fundamental ways. Um, and, you know, if it's, if, if it's more than just producing uh, a, a labor force, we should be able to, with, with the resources that now exist, uh, have education, I would argue, uh, that is about human fulfillment, right? Um, so that whatever you want to learn, you know, you want to learn how to be a astrophysicist, you want to learn how to be a brain surgeon, you want to learn how to be, you know, a, a maestro, you know, pianist or something like that, uh, or do two or three of them things, right? That uh, we need to get to a point where, um, you know, we, we uh, have the democratic control of the economy and how goods and services are produced and resourced, you know, uh, uh, and distributed, uh, that that humanity, all of humanity, not just a few, you know, have much more leisure time uh, to be able to explore, you know, the, the full gifts, you know, that all this gray matter that we've been endowed with, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, can utilize and produce. Um, that's not where we at, but I think that's what we need to, what we need to start fighting for. Uh, and that requires a shift, even a shift in, in the organizing work, you know, which I was trying to kind of, you know, lay, lay bare and make somewhat uh, implicit, uh, is that see some of the limitations with our old model around even like organizing, you know, uh, um, uh, it's still limited in, in the sense that it doesn't have a broad kind of universal or, or class perspective in the sense that you know, the graduate students are going to organize first and foremost, you know, to uh, um, maximize their position and, and reap the, 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 the most rewards for, for their position. But it's, it's inclined and oriented to get you from one place to another place, you know, to move you from being a graduate student to being a professor or, or, or something of that nature, right? So you still, within a certain dynamic, you know, it's still got aspirations of climbing that ladder, right? And not like, how do I do the you know, orientation of I'm developing these skills, you know, to be a better resource and, and, and uh, 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 member uh, of, of, a, of a community where I have a particular role, right? Or several roles, uh, that, that I've been, you know, I've, I've chosen both myself out of love and desire to be this, but also because there's an organic need to do X, Y, and Z, that, that I am being shepherded and, and moved and steered and guided and resourced to be able to develop this to serve that community. That's a, to answer that question, it pro provides a profound political movement, which is not just about, you know, how do we maximize uh, uh, our interest to, to secure the most resources for ourselves, but how do we shift the whole paradigm? You know, and that's a deeper question that I think we have to, to really grapple with. And that's why I was saying, I think the answer to that, to all to this, this, this piece to move it at least 
in the context of a university is how do how do you and the folks that said that you work with how do y'all relate to the immediate kind of community that's around you and to the other folks within your 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 community who do not have the, the access to the you know resource materials the education the, the equipment the things that that they could tap into to, to both learn and to, to learn how to change the material conditions around them right but but they learn it so that they can go back in their communities and do it themselves and not be dependent upon somebody coming to you know a, a provide a service to them that then extracts resources from them either in the form of, of you know monetary compensation or, or other resources you know um, and I'm saying that in the sense that you know we know um, in the US, you know, one of the, uh, the the service industries and in, in, in education in part falls within that thing. Um, you know, as it, as this society has moved less and less from both agriculture and industrial production into services, medical institutions and universities have been, you know, growing kind of leaps and bounds and have been playing some very negative roles uh, in the gutting and eviscerating of, 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 of Black Latino and working class communities through gentrification. So, you know, how are y'all directly the winds up question? I'm, I'm sitting back to like an organizer question as best I can. How does the situation, what's your role in helping those communities defend themselves? You know, so that, you know, in the time that you are there at the very least, you know, uh, you're putting some checks and breaks you know, on the institutions kind of expanding more and more in, into the community, gobbling it up uh, and rising, raising the property values in a, in a way that it moves people out, you know, and force people to leave because they can't pay the taxes or, the, you know, they don't have the income to sustain it in, in a particular way. You know, uh, how does the university, you know, uh, uh, change its charter and its, its purpose um, to not just serve, you know, because many of them say they, they, they kind of have serving the public interest as part of their charters. That needs to be redefined. Like how do you serve a common interest? And then who gets to determine what that common is in your community, right? Is it just the board of directors, right? Uh, or if it's a private board of directors and the shareholders or whatever, or, or you know, how do the folks in your, you know, let's say a five to 10 mile radius or whatever, you know, the criteria people want to construct uh, might be, or just that it's constructed through struggle. Like, how do they get brought into that process and then have, you know, uh, uh, democratic access and control to the, to the education and, and the services that, that are to render? This is ultimately, I think, where we need to, uh, to go to answer this question. Like, what is the purpose of education now in this, in this society? Um, you know, particularly when we go back to that disposable question, right? Because uh, this is not an economy which is producing a, a tremendous degree you know, it's, it's like this, you got to, you know, it's that inverted kind of bell, bell curve, right? You got a ton of, of, you know, low paying, that's what vast majority of low paying service jobs, you know, retail, fast food, you know, all that, that's the vast majority where things are at now. And then you got a, a small sector of high end service jobs, right? And, and it's up to, to, to construct some unity between those two to kind of bridge that, that gap if we, we try to pursue this from a, from a very conscious uh, uh, role. And I think graduate students, you know, and, and folks such as yourselves in the universities, you know, are thinking through these questions and trying to bring some radical politics to it. Like that's a critical piece that y'all gonna have to think through, I think in the course and figure out, you know, uh, what are the practical ways, you know, uh, to bridge that gap. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, thank you for that. Thank you so much for that as well. I think that that answered the question perfectly. I think that you um, sort of posing those who are within the university, our positionalities as not necessarily of the university community, but how does our position within the university serve our larger community, those who right. do not have access. Um, so I appreciate that. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm wrap us up now, uh, okay. Ali. I, I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the dialogue. I think that you gave us a lot to sit with, a lot to think about. 
Um, I'm think I'm already thinking about ways in which I can take what you said and implement it in some organizing efforts and just efforts within um, my space as well within the Center for Urban Education. So I wanted to personally thank you, um, and I'll bring in Dr. Dancy um, to give us some. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Chris. I am uh, full. Um, so much uh, for us to sit with and think of, think about. Uh, I'm uh, deeply motivated and so uh, grateful that uh, Kali Okuno has joined us in the Center for Urban Education and has joined us uh, in the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, important calls for us throughout this powerful dialogue as we transition uh, to the end. One of them I'm sitting with is that cultivating the radical imagination is not something we do on the way to an equity or justice or freedom. It is the way. How might we use our radical imagination to move toward a future, uh, in Kali's words, that is profoundly different? Uh, it's clear to me following this dialogue that radical study is important to this vision. And this is so timely today in this moment as we think about where we are, what is happening around us, uh, and seeing a potential Biden election in the context of a larger government and thinking politically about education. How might we do that um, uh, today? Uh, and differently from this point forward. Uh, we're grateful to our visiting scholar, uh, Kali Okuno, for his thoughtful mind, the sharpness of the critique and compelling talk, as well as our interlocutor, our own urban education PhD student, Christopher Wright, as well as our department chair for teaching, lead, learning, and leading, Dr. Sabina Vaught, for her dialogue behind the scenes. Kali is with us today and tomorrow, meeting with our Heinz Fellows, our graduate students, and Pittsburgh activists as a part of our Responding to Reality series. I hope that Kali will come back, uh, continue to teach us, think with us as we seriously move to work toward visions of justice and freedom for the most vulnerable masses. If you're just joining us for the first time, the Center for Urban Education's mantra is learn, share, and transform. Learning speaks to the knowledge we produce. Share speaks to efforts to share what we know and provide forum for our colleagues to do the same, such as this event, uh, but also the vision of mutual aid that is important to us uh, and transform speaks to our purpose. We are interested in fundamentally transforming education structures around power and power relations. This Lunch and Learn public talk is an initiative that engages this mantra. Our thanks to our center team, particularly Cassia Krogan and Sueño Viveros for their care of this event and our supportive Dean, Dr. Valerie Kinlock. Join us in December for our final event in 2020, which will be announced soon. Finally, know that we regularly update our website. Go to Q, C -U -E, dot pit, P -I -T -T dot edu to sign up for our listserv so you can receive news about our events and other projects. While you're on our website, check out our recent newsletter where you can read about our research, teaching, and service. Thanks so much for attending today. Take good care and be safe.